Diversity varies around the planet. And you can see here in this figure, the more colorful areas toward the equator have a much greater number of species per hectare. As one goes up in elevation, there's a slight increase in biodiversity until you get past mid-elevations when biodiversity declines as the more stressful environments are higher up, tend to be very cold and dry. Here are some high steps in Asia with the elephants on the plains below the barren rock, which has very few species living there. And here are some very high elevation places in different parts of the world. In South America, the montane forests giving way to cloud forests, and then Paramo in the alpine zone, and a rain shadow effect seeing, seen as one goes over the crest of the mountain. Mount Kenya, in figure B below, going high enough up, well, there's a lot of cultivation that has cleared the forest and bamboo growing into the alpine zone top, topped with a glacier, the nevel zone, or that under ice. And Mount Kibo, you can see much more forest, much less cultivation, savanna below, and a cold desert above the alpine zone before the ice zone. Many processes influence biodiversity from local to landscape to regional, continental, and global. And these all happen at increasingly long scale, time scales. There are a number of models that have been used to explain biodiversity, null models, those that in which it doesn't matter which species comes in and replaces the other, neutral theory, speciation, dispersal, and extinction. And then there are deterministic models that depend on the amount of available energy for dispersal and things coming in. There are both equilibrium and non-equilibrium models. Remember that some communities are more diverse if they're not at equilibrium. The three kinds of diversity we've run into before, alpha diversity, which is simply the number of species present, and that's the number of individuals in those species is influenced by the energy available. Gamma diversity is regional diversity, all of the local diversities added up to be the global or regional diversity, and then there's beta diversity that depends on environmental heterogeneity or how species change as you move from one local site to another. Beta diversity sometimes is called turnover. And in our book there's this table listing different models of diversity gradients and their components. Temporal covariance where species diversity is maintained because as one species becomes more abundant, another becomes less abundant. And when um, things, there are lots of nutrients around high productivity, competitive exclusion can take place, so diversity decreases. Then the energy model, where the more energy the greater the diversity. More resources, more species can coexist. So all these different diversity models have some things in common. The reason that diversity varies is that environmental factors vary over the surface of the earth, and that affects density of individuals and species. Because in any environment in a fixed area, the more individuals, the chances are the more species are present. And the greater 
the averages of something, the greater the variance. So that more gr larger niches, more ecological space can be there for whatever factor you're considering. And of course, the idea of trade-offs, that species good at one thing may not be good at another thing. No, no one can be, no species can be good at everything at the same, same time. So if you look at a, a meta look or meta-analysis of studies looking at how productivity affects species diversity. The, if we look at local scale, landscape scale, regional, and global scale, the majority of studies at all these levels show a humped diversity curve. That is, diversity increases with increasing productivity up to a point, then it declines. But there are some other distributions, too. U-shape, high, then low, then high. In some, except for global. Positive, increasing, and negative. And then a number with no correlation at all. So taking a look at this map again with the diversity zones shown in different colors, this can translate to the next figure. So the colors mean different things here. They stand for different continents. But you can see that, in general, continents that are toward the equator at the lower latitudes are less similar to each other than are um, places either more north or south. Um, so. The, the colder the places, the more similar those places are, probably in part because species diversity is lower, as well as the climate being more stressful and more seasonal. In this figure, we see isoclines of species diversity in the continental U.S. and Canada, North America, maybe I should say, very low species diversity north, increasing as you come south, especially to the southeast where it's the highest of all. And even though Florida is diverse, you can see that in this deep southeast where the cove forests and other variations are, diversity is a little bit higher. But we can focus on the deserts, which are in the southwest, this swath that says 80. And the diversity of the deserts looks a lot different at different times of the year. When it's very dry or dry for many years, not too many species are evident. But after a rain, many things pop up and dry-looking perennial shrubs also bloom. So the number of species present at any given site, any given locality, somewhat depends on the number of species available in that region or the species pool. So local species richness is correlated with regional species richness. In a place without too many species, from site to site, there's not m as much variation. So this is another explanation for why we saw that pattern in the colored dots representing the continent's figure.